The year was 1866, and in a log cabin in Franklin, Kentucky, Thomas Chisholm was born. And he never went to high school, and he never went to college. He eventually became an elementary teacher, an elementary school teacher at the age of 16. Five years later, he was named the associate editor of the Franklin favorite, the local newspaper. When he was 27, he attended a revival service, and he gave his life to Christ. And in the years following, he served as a pastor, and later, uh, I guess pastoring got hard for him. He became an insurance agent. Um, he lived for a time in Indiana and then um, went and pastored in Jersey. And during his lifetime, he wrote over 1,200 poems. In 1923, he sent one of these poems to um, the Moody Bible Institute, and they were so impressed by one of those poems that they decided to put it to music. He published it privately, little knowing that it would become one of the most beloved songs of the 20th century. Writing in 1941, he wrote, My income had not been large at any point in my life due to impaired health in the earlier years, which has followed me all of these days. And although I must fail, not fail to record here the unfailing faithfulness of a covenant-keeping God, and that he has given me many wonderful displays of his loving care, for which I am filled with astonishing gratefulness. I love that word, astonishing gratefulness. That should be our testimony. And the hymn he wrote is based on our text. It's a song that we sang as we closed off our worship service, Great is Thy Faithfulness. But there's something of a paradox in how we use that hymn. We sing it here in worship services. We sing it at weddings. We sing it when we graduate, we sing it when things are going well in our lives. But the context of where that verse was written, it was written in Israel's lowest moment of their life. Bab Babylonians had come in and destroyed the city, burned it to ashes. The temple was gone. The people were taken captive. Um, Jeremiah is sitting there, sitting on the ashes, weeping over the city. His mood is black. His words are dark and angry. His tone is one of absolute despair. And for most of the book of Lamentations, there is not a light of hope at all. And then we come to our text and the light begins to break through. What a challenge that is. It's easy for us to sing, great is your faithfulness at a wedding. It's a lot harder to sing it when you don't know what the future holds, right? It's easy for us to sing God's faithfulness when you're standing there with your diploma in hand. It's more difficult to sing it when you're not sure what the next steps of life are, if there's a job awaiting for you or not. We can gladly sing it when an operation is successful or when we give birth to a child. But what about when the doctor tells us that he's got bad news or things didn't turn out the way it was supposed to turn out. And the text is not an answer to the mysteries of life. It's not about politics or the circumstances we face every day. It's not a detailed statement about the intricate theology. It's rather a word about God. It's a word that declares that he is our hope in the midst of hopelessness. He is our light when all around is darkness. He is the way when we can find no way. He's the reason for living when we would rather give up. And the text contains four phrases. There's four lines in these two verses, and each one raises a very important question that we need to consider. The first question that we have to consider is, why doesn't God destroy me? Why doesn't God destroy me? That's not just a theoretical question. We all live closer to the edge than we think. There's a thin line between disaster and prosperity, joy and sorrow, laughter and tears and life and death. Let a car swerve in front of you. Let a bullet come three inches closer. Let a tiny switch malfunction and the plane crash. Let a train jump off the tracks. Let the brakes give away on your car. Let a stray germ enter into your system. Let a lightning flash and in a moment we're gone. Who can understand the mysteries of the universe? Why are you alive today and someone else is dead? Why is it that we have been to so many funerals and no one has been to ours yet? Hear the word of Jeremiah. Because of the Lord's great love, we're not consumed. 
because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Why doesn't God destroy us? He should and he could. He should, he could because he's God, and he should because we're sinners. Why doesn't he? Because of his great love toward us. The Hebrew word for love there is the word hesed. It's a word that's rich in meaning. It's within it the idea of a loyal love, a love that will never let go because it doesn't depend on how we feel, but it's a love that's committed based on a commitment that it's made in prior. God loves us because he promises to love us. He promises to never give up on us, and nothing that we do can cause him to break that promise. It leads me to another observation. Maybe life is difficult for you right now, but as bad as things are, if it wasn't for God, things would be so much worse. That seems obvious, and perhaps it is, but we need to hear it again. If it weren't for God and for God's great love for us, no matter how bad things are in your life right now, they could be so much worse without the Lord. We tend to forget that. We go with this sense of entitlement. I deserve this. I've earned this. And even when we pray, we think, I've been so good to God that God has to answer my prayers. How little we understand God's grace. Christianity Today, Christianity Today several years ago, published a sermon from a pastor who had been diagnosed with cancer. He had gone through treatment and returned to his pulpit to um, share about his experience. The doctors told him that they couldn't cure him even after the treatment. And in fact, that he was not going to live for a long time. What do you say to a congregation in a moment like that? He remarked for the first time in his life, he felt that he understood God's grace. He wasn't afraid of dying per se, but suddenly he realized that at the age of 33, he wasn't going to be able to live to see 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 He might live a few more weeks or a few more months, maybe a year, but without a miracle of God, he wouldn't live much longer than that. And then it hit him. For years, he had expected that he he was going to live for a long, long time. And that that meant he had plenty of time to improve himself, to get rid of bad habits, to repair broken relationships, to grow in grace, to um, do the things he wanted to do. And now for the first time, he realized that he didn't have the time to do it. He would have to go into eternity less than he wanted to be. Some habits unchanged, some relationships unrepaired, some spiritual growth not accomplished. And that's when he realized how much he would have to depend on God's grace to be able to make it. Not just theoretically, but practically and totally. If God's grace wasn't enough, then he was in trouble because there wasn't enough time for massive self-improvement. Romans 5 became so precious to him because it speaks of Christ dying for us while we were yet sinners. Our salvation hangs on that word, yet. Not just that we were sinners once and then God saved us and now we're perfect, but that we are still sinners desperately in need of God's grace. There are a lot of people that teach that all religions are the same, that all you have to do is hold to the golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. That sounds really nice, but is it true? Can I suggest to you that behind the golden rule for a believer lies a greater truth, that we are to do unto others as God has done to us, that we are to show the love of God to people the way that he has shown his love toward us, that it's not just about how we want people to treat us, it's about letting, showing others how God has loved us. That's what grace really means. Can I be honest that this is one of the hardest doctrines for us to believe? Even in church, we struggle with it. C.S. Lewis, one of the greatest theologians of the past century, was passing by a group of seminary students um, discussing what feature of Christianity separated it from other religions. And without even blinking, he just looked at them and he said, grace, of course. That's what separates our faith from every other faith. It's that God loved us while we were yet sinners. 
Do you want mercy or do you want justice? If you want justice, you'll have it, but you'll be sorry for it. If mercy, you can have it, but remember when you receive it that you didn't get it because you deserve it. Why doesn't God destroy us? Because of his great love for us. The second question that you've got to ask is, how do I know that God will keep on loving me? And Jeremiah answers, he says, his compassions never fail. His compassions never fail. The best part of that little phrase, it's not there, um, is the word compassions. Notice it's plural. It's a very unusual word in English. God's compassions is plural. It comes in like wave after wave. James 4, James writes that God gives us more grace. In John 1, he says he gives us one blessing after another blessing. I mentioned it earlier, but a lot of us have this developed sense of entitlement. And along the way, we've lost our sense of gratitude for all the blessings that God has given us. And I think that's especially true regarding the simple blessings of everyday living. In the words of Andy Rooney, for most of life, nothing wonderful happens. He goes on to say that if you can't find happiness in things like having coffee with your wife or sitting down with your friends and family, then you're probably not going to be very happy at all. If you sit around dreaming about winning the big contract or hoping to find the love of your life and hoping that they will call you or wondering when the Cowboys are going to win the Super Bowl, You're going to spend most of your days waiting for something that isn't going to happen. Amen. (laughs) Meanwhile, the sun will rise tomorrow and you won't see it. A friend will say hello and it won't matter. Your children will laugh and giggle and you won't smile. The roses will bloom. Snow will cover your yard. Your husband will offer to rub your back. The worship team will sing your favorite song. But because it's ordinary and because you've seen it before and because you've heard it before and because you've done it before and because you're dreaming about a future that you're missing out on the blessings of God in your life today. Listen, how blessed we are and how easy it is for us to forget what God has done for us. If we only had eyes to see what God has done for us, his compassions never fail. The third question that Jeremiah answers for us is, when will God give me what I need? And in verse 23, he answers, they are new every morning. Here's the hope. Here's a word of hope for fearful saints. God's mercies are new every morning. In the book of Exodus, the people of Israel were wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know where they got their food from every day? God provided it for them. Every morning they would wake up and there was manna that was lying outside of their tent. He would provide food every single day. He instructed them to gather just as much as they wanted for the day and to make sure that they had nothing left over at the end of the day. They weren't supposed to store it up. They weren't supposed to build a um, storage unit and keep it for as long as they can. They were just supposed to collect enough for that day. And in order to drive the point home, God told them that if they did store it up, he would send maggots and they would come and spoil the manna. They were to gather just enough for that day and eat it that day and gather no more for the next day. And what God was doing was he was teaching his people to trust him for every single day. Think about what that means. Me and you, we don't have to live on yesterday's blessings. They are new every morning. God's blessings are never early, but they're never late. They're new every morning. Today's mercies are for today's problems. Tomorrow's mercies will be for tomorrow's problems. They're new Every morning, there's a song that's been written by Laura Story called Blessings, and you guys hear it on Christian radio, but the words goes like this. We pray for blessings. We pray for peace, comfort for family, protection while we sleep. We pray for healing, for prosperity. We pray for your mighty hand to ease our suffering. And all the while, you hear each spoken need, yet love us way too much to give us lesser things. Because what if your blessings come through raindrops? 
What if your healings come through tears? What if a thousand sleepless nights are what it takes to know that you are near? What if the trials of this life are your mercies in disguise? We pray for wisdom, your voice to hear. We cry in anger that you cannot, that when we cannot feel you're near. We doubt your goodness, we doubt your love, as if every promise from your word is not enough. And all the while you hear each desperate plea and long that we would have faith to believe. When friends dis- betray us, when darkness seems to win, we know the pain reminds this heart that this is not our home. What if my greatest disappointments or the aching of this life is the revealing of a greater thirst of this world can never satisfy? What if trials of this life, the rain, the storms, the hardest nights are God, your mercies in disguise? See, we all wonder what's going to happen tomorrow. Will we have jobs tomorrow? Will we continue to stay in good health? What about our children? Will they serve God? What if something happens to them? Singles, you guys wonder if you'll ever get married. Married people, you guys look at all the divorce that's going on and wonder if they'll ever make it. We all have concerns about our career choices and wonder where we'll be in 10 years. God's mercies are new every morning. They come day by day. They come when we need them, not earlier, not later. God gives us what we need today. If he needed more, he'll give us more. When we need something else, he'll give us that as well. Nothing we will truly need will ever be withheld from us. Search your problems and within, and within them you will discover the well-disguised mercies of God. The final question that Jeremiah asks, that he answers is, what is my hope for the future? And he closes by saying, great, is your faithfulness. This is the text that we sang earlier. But here's a simple way to bring it back to focus. Great is our fickleness, but great is God's faithfulness. Me and you, me, we may grow weary, but God can't. Me and you, we may give up, but God can't. Me and you, we change, but God doesn't. Me and you will waver, but God doesn't. We will disappoint ourselves and we'll disappoint other people, but God doesn't. We may fail a thousand times, but God cannot fail, not even once. God's faithfulness is so great that we can rest assured that when we come to the final bend in the road, that he will be there to make sure that we enter into our eternal home. Four questions. Why doesn't God destroy me? Because of your great love, we're not consumed. How do I know that God will keep on loving me? Because his compassions never fail. When will God give me what I need? His mercies are new every morning. What's my hope for the future? The faithfulness of God. Great is your faithfulness. I'll give you one more word from C.S. Lewis because he's my favorite author. He said, he who has God and many other things has no more than he who has God alone. He who has God and many other things has no more than he who has God alone. A lot of us in this room, we're blessed to have many, many other things. We have money. We have security. We have friends. We have family. But do we have God? Do we trust him with our lives? If you do, then the many other things don't matter one way or the other. Because if you have God and if you know Jesus, you have more than enough. Because God is faithful. He will take care of you every step of the way. This week as we celebrate Thanksgiving and we look back on all of the blessings that we've received... And we can remember all the big things that God has done. But the very simple fact that we are sitting here speaks of God's faithfulness in our lives. The very simple fact that we have health speaks of God's faithfulness in our lives. So easy to look for the big things and dream for the big picture when we forget that he's been faithful every step of the way. 
that when we sleep, he watches us. When we drive, he protects us. When we work, he gives us wisdom. When we are with family and friends, he gives us discernment on what to say. He is faithful. So as we come to the table, the greatest reminder of God's faithfulness in our lives, a great reminder that while we were yet sinners, God got involved. God interjected himself into my life and into your life. And when we were destined for eternity without him, he pulled us in, made us a part of his family, changed everything about us, called us sons, called us daughters. What Jesus did on the cross is the greatest reminder of God's faithfulness to us. As you come to the cross this morning, I don't, as you come to the table this morning, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if everything's perfect or if you're wondering, God, what are you doing? Where are you leading? Can I remind you that his mercies are new every morning. He is with you. He'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. Why? Where, where is our hope? Our hope is in a faithful God. A faithful God. Even when we are unfaithful, He remains faithful. This morning I'm going to invite you to examine your hearts and your lives. Can I suggest that how you live your life speaks more powerfully than what you believe? Do you live your life in such a way that you declare that I serve a faithful God? Or do you live your life in worry and anxiety, wondering, God, are you going to take care of me? Examine your attitudes, your affections, your desires. See if there's stuff in your life that's not from God. And would you run to Jesus and ask him for repentance and allow him to work in you this morning? And whenever you're ready, come and grab the elements. And come back to your seat and we'll partake of communion together. Let's pray. Father, forgive us that oftentimes the only time we think about your faithfulness is in a week like this of Thanksgiving and we look back. You are faithful every single day. It is only because of your grace and your mercy that we are who we are. We are where we are. And it might not be the way we pictured it, but it's so much better than if you were not involved in our lives. You are so good. And this morning I pray that our hearts would overflow in gratitude and worship to a God whose compassions never fail, whose mercies are new every morning, who is faithful till the end. We love you. We worship you. In Jesus' name.